This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. We get all of our encoders started, so uh, I know there's a bunch of people listening, so... uh we're just going to roll this thing over. Start from the beginning here with our shout out. Uh, and uh, one is going to go out to Tim Hawley. Uh, Tim Hawley uh, was going to try to get him on the show tonight, guys, but uh, apparently couldn't, uh, couldn't make it. But um, he's, got, uh, he's got what sounds like a braggot going, uh, a DIPA inspired. Uh, looks like something along a uh, IPA pale ale lager, uh, and uh, he used uh, three quarters of a pound of hops uh, apparently Centennial and Cascade, and he uh, quick carb this uh, at 25 pounds, uh, shaking it until it wouldn't push uh, any more CO2 into the keg, and then he hooked it up and. Uh, and uh, uh, he got it going pretty good here. So he's got it at eight pounds uh, per square inch and let it sit for about a half a day, he says. And uh, it turned out excellent. So uh, wish uh, wish I could get a taste of that. But uh, Tim Hawley, uh, good job on uh, what sounds like a pretty good uh, bracket going there. Another shout out, Tim Witt, wine and mead making enthusiast Facebook group. Uh, this is, uh, I guess he uh, updated uh, his uh, post. Uh, he's got one of these conical fast fermenter uh, 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 containers. Uh, and if you've seen these, it looks like a big teardrop. And they've got stands uh, for them that you can, uh, you know, floor-mounted thing that holds it up or pretty unique uh, you know system you can even buy these racks that uh, you mount on the wall and these things just kind of hang there but the unique thing about these uh, conical uh, fast fermenter uh, fermenters is they have this bulb thing on the bottom that collects all of your spent yeast and trub and 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 sediment and, and whatnot so that you don't have to rack so uh, once you start, you go all the way through primary into secondary, and, uh, you know, uh, I guess the only time you'd really rack, I don't know if you can bottle from these things or not, but I suppose you could. Uh, but it'd be kind of cool not having to, you know, have to rack off of anything, just leave it all in one container. So uh, I can picture myself having these things hung all over the walls of my place here, but I'm sure my wife would probably have something... Other, you know, she came home and found all the pictures taken down off the walls and all these fermenters hanging in their place. I'm sure I would probably be looking for a new place to sleep that night. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I feel you, uh, man. I feel you. <laughs> yeah, the mad scientist chic wouldn't fly at my house either. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, you know, it's been it's bad enough. I've got you know the the twins sitting on a uh, my brew shelf behind me, so. <laughs> You know, what the heck. But uh, Tim Hawley at uh, Mead Makers Facebook group and uh, Tim Witt at Wine and Mead Making Enthusiast. Shout out from uh, the boys here on the Mead House. Welcome to the show. Putting up a little bit of audio issues to start with. So we just kind of start everything all over again here. Um, you know, uh, Aaron had sent us, uh, we, we're going into this, uh, you know, what are we drinking thing and uh aaron had sent us some meat so that's what i'm drinking tonight and uh i cracked open this bottle of uh, cranberry so let's do this again aaron uh this is this is beyond anything any mead that i have ever tasted this has got a most unique flavor and um it, it, it initially has that dryness that you often, you know, that you find with cranberry juice. Um, but I can't tell, I, I just, I guess I got I have to drink more. I can't tell what it is on the back end. 
I will say this honey w- definitely produced a, a just a fascinating flavor profile in the mead. Um, I have my tasting notes pulled up from the four honey varietal experimental batches I ran, one being the cranberry blossom, then also blueberry raspberry blossoms, and then lastly, sunflower. And uh, what what I'm getting from this cranberry, kind of like you're saying, kind of a dry, I described as a tart, even a little sour flavor that, that kind of punches you there up front, but then the aftertaste to me, tasted a little bit malty, almost like an unboiled malt extract type of a flavor that, that I was getting there. I'm wondering if this carbonated, um, you know, uh, might not taste bad either. I could see that. You know, this might be a really interesting honey, too, to make a hopped meat out of as well with you know, kind of the the tartness that you're getting up front with some of the the malty tones in in the aftertaste, maybe some hops in there might be interesting, especially if if we left it with a little bit more residual sweetness. Um, all four of these batches came out pretty much on the dry side, around you know the the one zero 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 to you know one point zero zero one mark. Um, so so they definitely all came out pretty much on the dry side well and that, you know it's right on the mark for me uh you know i mean i'm probably sound like a broken record at this point but i i just don't i don't like sweet real sweet stuff and this is right on the money uh as far as sweetness dryness uh you know goes so yeah but the hop thing i mean and you you know we talked you know before the audio issues here in the beginning we were talking how you said this was a dark honey, and it's got that dark flavor, almost synonymous with the uh, cooked honey, the uh, caramelized honey uh, stuff that I was doing here a few weeks back. Oh, absolutely. That's one thing I've really noticed, too, with, with some of the different honeys that I've used is that a, a dark honey, I, I really like dark honey in, in a traditional mead. Um so, so for all of you guys, I, I sent you each four bottles each of the the honey varietal experiments. Then to kind of compare and contrast to my older process before I had discovered, you know, the Tosna method and, and degassing and, and pH management and all those types of things. Um, I sent you each a, a sweet mead that I made maybe a year and a half, a couple of years ago. But then for the sixth one. I kind of mix it up a little bit. So, J.D., I, I know you've just been really diving into the whole Braggot thing. So so I sent you a, a bottle of one of my old Braggots. You know, Chris is the, the Melamel guy. So um, he got a, a raspberry Melamel. Um, but for Jeff, I, I know he was interested in trying some different honey varietals. So I had a, a dark wildflower traditional that I made Again, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, it's actually the base mead for the raspberry mel that I I sent to uh, to Chris, and I just I really like the flavor that I get from that darker wildflower honey. Yeah, well, that I actually drank that all, that one already, and it did really have some nice complex flavors in it. And that braggot, my God, that was dude, that was good. A little, a little on the sweet side. Uh, we communicated about that already, but I'm telling you, man, that that's right up my alley. And uh, we'll get more into the bracket discussion here in a little bit. But um, I cut the sweetness down in a, a little bit and add. You know, we were talking how much hops, and you know, I know hop additions come in typically ounces, not pounds. So. You know, I mean, how do you determine how much more to add? I guess you just got to make it and taste it and hope for the best. But uh, just a, a just a little bit more hop value to it. Uh, and man, that braggot was good. I, I really like that. So awesome. The uh, the sunflower. I'm just taking a sip of the sunflower. That's another very unique uh, taste. Got this, got this nuttiness. This almost, t- I mean, it tastes like sunflower to me. I, that, I, that was I, my favorite. The, the sunflower was my favorite of the four varietals. Yeah. 
What, what yeah, did you find? Uh, how did you find the sunflower? Describe the flavor to uh, what you got. The first thing, the first thing that hit me was buttery. It's it's buttery. It's got almost a bourbon quality without the oak, but it's also on the back end. It's got some beer quality to it. And yes. I guess that's the malty, and, and that may be from your attempt at, at using the, the beer yeast to begin with. Uh, they may be throwing some flavors in there. Um, but, yeah, it, it's kind of buttery, creamy, uh, malty. It's a little bit sharp. It's got a certain um, tang to it that I think that's probably going to go away with age. Um, I'm going to say that, that that one... If you if you put that sunflower back for a year, uh, uh, that that thing's going to really come around and be something. Uh, I, I think you could win contests with that if with some age on it. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, it's just so interesting to hear the flavors that you guys are getting off of that. I this is one the sunflower that I've noticed quite a change in from when it first came out of primary to kind of where it's at now, or even a, a couple few weeks ago, last time I, I sampled some, when it first came out of the, the carboy, I, I was thinking I was getting some like apple juice and fruity flavors. And with some of the more recent samples, you use the word nutty and almost like that sunflower flavor sunflower seed flavor and and that's definitely where i'm seeing it go to is is kind of that nuttiness um yeah. but then also i i wrote down just some other descriptive words of tart and bright even a little sharp um so so definitely i, I have to agree with chris too the sunflower blossom of, of the four honey varietals was my favorite as well yeah this um i, I would i would even drop some oak into this and uh, I mean, this, this is really good. This, I would serve this with fish, with chicken. You know, if you're into matching wines and food and, and that kind of thing, uh, this is an ex this this is a very good table wine that I would enjoy with dinner. Uh, but uh, Jeff, did you get the sunflower as, as well? I did. Um, so full disclosure, I've been kind of trying to be circumspect about how much I'm sampling at once here. So I've only just popped open the raspberry tonight. Uh, it's the first of the, uh, the the varietal bottles that I'm opening up here. All right. Well, um, well, that's, that's what JD's drinking tonight. I'm drinking three bottles of, uh, and I'll try the next one uh, here in a little while, but uh, I'm drinking three bottles of, uh, of Aaron's uh, meads here. So uh, I assume the rest of you are doing the same thing, Jeff? Absolutely. Like I've said, I've uh, popped open the, the raspberry, um, and it is, it, it's actually really nice. I'm really enjoying it. And I let my wife sample a little bit before we went on and wound up having to pour her a glass because she really enjoyed it as well. Um, it's got a nice, it, it's dry, like you mentioned. Um, it has a nice little bite to it on the, the, the front end. Um, you get a little bit of that raspberry aroma as you kind of let it sit in your mouth. And it has a really crisp, nice tannic finish. I might like a little bit more tannin in it. But overall, it's for a, a straight traditional, it is really nicely done. Now, is that the same raspberry that uh, that I got? It is. Was, it is. And that, that yeah, was my... Really what, Chris? Yeah, it, that's the raspberry blossom varietal that you that you're talking about now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm odd, to have the raspberry melomel. So, oddly enough, the raspberry was my least favorite of all. Of well, I haven't tried the other, the third one sitting here yet, but uh, that was the least favorite of mine for some reason. I just, uh, I, I just could not get around it. Uh, you know, I took a couple of sips and and just had to set the glass down. I could not take a, I could not take a, you know a, a whole glass of it. Um, you know, I mean, 
it you know what's unique about this whole thing is our, our is our different tastes uh, and how they differ uh, from one another, uh, which is another I think another unique part of this show too. You know, um, you know I've messed around with uh, with different flavors and, and some I can put up with others. I just find they're just absolutely foul, but other people, you know, seem to enjoy. So uh, I think that's the cool thing about this show. But, you know, sorry to say, Aaron, the raspberry, it, it just left a bad taste in my mouth. I could not get around it. Um, you know, uh, tried a couple times. Uh, now, I drank it cold. Uh, I haven't tried any of these at room temperature, and I know... You know, that, that seems to be, uh, there's a new discussion happening out there amongst a lot of these meteries that have tap rooms and, and uh, these, you know, little, uh, you know, areas where they serve mead, that they're starting to serve them at room temperature, which really changes the flavor. Uh, uh, actually, you know, from, from my experience, actually quite a bit. So, uh you know, perhaps uh, I still have the bottle in the refrigerator. Perhaps I should just leave it out on the counter, let it come to room temperature, try it again. Uh, it may present a different, uh, you know, a different flavor. I just want to say something about the uh, the raspberry mellow Mel. Uh, you you hit the balance on this perfect. Um, when I make a, a raspberry or or any other mellow Mel for that matter. You all know that I like the fruit bombs. I go all the way. I, yep. I pack it with fruit. This one is not packed with fruit, but it's also on the drier side, which works perfect. I mean, it, you know, it's it's not a very strong raspberry flavor, but the raspberry is definitely there, and and the sweetness level is perfect to balance where the raspberry is at. Um, if you had put any more raspberry in it, you would have needed a lot more sweetness. Uh, but you nailed this one perfectly on the on the balance there. Awesome, good to hear. Yeah, I, that is one that when it it first came out of the carboy back back in the dark ages of you know not not following the Tosta method at, at that point in time, I wasn't degassing. And I, I definitely think, you know, the same thing for the, the bottle you got, Jeff. Like I say, that, that wildflower traditional was the base mead for the raspberry melomel. And the raspberry melomel, I, I added the fruit in the secondary. I, I feel like it definitely threw off a lot of fusel alcohol and, and kind of the, the hot Listerine-type flavor. But um, definitely I, I think the age has served it well, and it's, it's definitely rounded out over time. Um, so... Glad to hear you're enjoying it. You didn't. You didn't have temperature control on any of these, did you? Nope. Nope. Just uh, you did. You did really good because uh, uh, there's not a lot of fusels in the ones that I have. There are some, and I think in that sunflower that some of that sharpness uh, that I'm getting, I think some of that may be fusels, and that's why I said when this thing sits for a year, it's going to be really something to to taste uh, because what I'm tasting all the, uh, the, the the tanginess is going to go away and this thing's going to smooth out a lot over the next year uh, it's I, too bad you only made one gallon yeah <laughs> that's what I was thinking too I, I wish I had done a bigger batch of that sunflower especially is it uh, is it cloudy by nature or you, you just didn't let this clear all the way, or not, you let it clear naturally, or at least as long as you could stand to let it go. Or that's right. Yeah, I I let them clarify just naturally. I didn't use any clarifying agents or anything like that. Um, actually, the first three that I bottled, which were the um, the cranberry, blueberry, and sunflower, clarified faster. Definitely, I, I probably could have let them sit a little bit longer and, and clarify even more. Um, and then with the raspberry, I think I actually sucked up a little bit of the lees when I was bottling, despite my best effort. So, so I think that one also turned out a little bit more on the cloudy side as well. Um, but yeah, just just time and natural clarification on these. 
I think, um, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I suppose Chris is right, but man, I'm telling you, this sunflower, it's drinkable right now. I mean, I, I would absolutely put this on the dinner table with a nice, uh, uh, baked halibut uh, with a little lemon sauce and, you know, uh, I mean, this is really good. I, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I just poured a second glass. So, uh, that's definitely, uh, you know, if you still have the recipe, that's definitely one that's got to go on the website. Um, I mean, I don't know how, how easy it is to get a hold of sunflower, uh, honey, but, uh, man, this stuff is good. Just out of curiosity, what, where did these finish, roughly, gravity-wise? Down in the neighborhood of, like, 1.001. Okay. That's Yeah, that's, that, that's good. I like that. That's just almost bone dry. Yeah. It's down there. Yeah, it's down there. Well, well just, just uh, if you don't mind, just real quick, I, I just wanted yeah, to chime yeah. in, too, on the uh, the raspberry blossom. And, and I don't want to, you know, bias Jeff, who who hasn't tried all of them yet. But, um, J.D., <laughs> I, I have to, to echo your opinion on that one. I, I think of the four, that was definitely my least favorite. Um, I I felt like that one definitely had the, the most fusel alcohol production out of all four of them, which is interesting because they all fermented, you know, with the, the same yeast, the same temperatures, the same degassing and, and everything. Um, but it, it just definitely had the, the most of that hot alcohol flavor to me. There were some interesting things going in there. I, I felt like it, it had a nice crispness and, and tartness to it. Um, and, and in some ways that the, the fusel alcohols gave it kind of a nice warming quality. Um, but all in all, I, I felt like that was my least favorite of, of all four of them. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, as far as this, um, as a sunflower goes, like I said, I mean, uh, you know, I would absolutely make this recipe. And I think if it was me, uh, I would probably drop some oak in it. Um, and just let it sit for a couple of months on some, you know, some medium toast oak. Uh, don't want a whole lot of oakiness, just, just, just a, just a tad. Uh, and this is absolutely something that I would serve, you know, with dinner. So I'm really enjoying this, and uh, thanks a million. But uh, and if you're, it, of it, you're going to forget the whole show because this stuff's got some alcohol in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and I've already had one of my pumpkin beers today, too, so and I've, I've got to be very careful about how much alcohol I consume with this freaking thing I've got going on. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Tim Hawley responded. Uh, he heard the shout-out. He's listening to the show. Uh, you bet, Tim. And, hey, if you go to uh, themeathouse.com, click on the Contact Us tab up there. And uh, you can send us an email, and uh, we'd be glad to take your recipes in and take a look at them, and uh, put them up on the website and uh, credit you for the for the uh, recipe. So uh, just go to themeathouse.com and click on contact us and uh, get in touch with us. But uh, um, so you know, we we wanted to continue talking about. And I think I have found my, uh, I think I have found the direction I want to go with mead. Uh, and that's in the, in, in the Braggot area. I think it's unexplored territory. If I can, you know, uh, go back to the Star Trek days. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a whole world out there that hasn't been explored yet in, in, in the name of Braggot's. And I, I can see all kinds of things happening out there. I got to go back to this braggot that Aaron had sent me. That is absolutely right up my alley, dude. I mean, if it wasn't for the sweetness and it could stand to be a little bit more hoppy, uh, that's absolutely something that I would carry around in a six pack and hand out to, you know, friends and relatives. Um, and just so people know, I tried to steer you right. I tried to 
I tried to bring you into the world of melon wells. I bought you books and sent you to school. And, and we lost you to the Braggit world. So, well, I, you know, I'm a. I guess this goes back to. Uh, I mean, I'm a beer drinker. I'm a beer drinker and a bourbon drinker, and. Uh, you know, I prefer my bourbon at room temperature straight up like a man ought to drink his bourbon. And I like my beers ice cold, hoppy. I like to taste what it's made of. And, uh, you know, this may be, it may be that I am just not a mead drinker per se. Uh, you know, and that's not because I've had a lot of failures. I mean, I got some pretty good stuff going on here, but. Uh, some of the, some of the store bought more popular brands that are out there that I've had, I've just, I just, you know, it's a, it's not even a casual. I mean, it's not refrigerator and say, oh, I'm thirsty. Let's pour a glass of mead. Uh, drink it because I just want to get rid of the bottle and I and I want to use the bottle. Uh, you know, nothing that I can get excited about, but this Braggit thing that we're exploring is right up my alley. And uh, uh, I, you know, I, I have to say that I, I did not complete my homework assignment. Sorry, guys. So take me in the corner and beat me to a pulp. Um, but as we talked on the last show, uh, we were supposed to go out and kind of explore different recipes and and hop values and what they contribute to flavors and that kind of thing. I still don't know enough about hops to know the difference between one hopper and another. Um, I am uh, I am considering one uh, beer kit uh, over at Northern Brewer, and that's that bourbon barrel. I think it's a, called a bourbon barrel porter. I've got it printed out here somewhere. Um, but that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, bourbon barrel porter. That that's what I'm looking at as far as what I would like to do uh, for a for a uh, braggot. So uh, what what do you guys have uh, uh, discovered? Uh, let's start. Let's start with uh, with Jeff. What have you discovered out there? Well, um, <clears throat> so I I uh, rather than doing some new homework, I just kind of took some experiments that I've done previously and uh, figured I would bring those to the table. Um, last week, you guys talked about the recipe that I shared with uh, the one that's ongoing, and I've, I've not even tried it since I put the, the uh, must together. So um, that's still a work in progress. But I do have a, a previous um, brew that I've done. It was a, bo- or, um, a braggot that was a, uh, a porter and boche uh, combination. Mm-hmm. And it came out well. It took a very long time to get there, but it came out really nice. Uh, it's actually one that won uh, second place in a local competition here a few weeks ago. Awesome! And Congratulations! Thank you. Um, so basically, I started with a, a kit from my local homebrew store for a cold soak porter. And what made this unique is that um, there's there's a bunch of different grains that go into this. There are okay, some that I, are... I got I got to stop you right there. Uh, you you already lost me. What is a cold soak porter? Okay, and what, what is that? yeah, I, I was in the direction of uh, going into that here. Um, okay. There are a go few ahead. different grains and uh, fermentables other than the honey um, that will go into this brew. Um, we've got some specialty grains that give it the um, the headiness and the the um, the the mouthfeel and the, um, the head retention is the the term I was looking for there. Um, and there are some other grains that give it the, that dark, roasty, um, multi porter character. Um, what the cold soak entails is that when you start with with this brew, uh, the day before you go to brew, you actually put those the dark grains and the the roasty uh, grains in cold water. And the same way we were cold brewing coffee, uh, oh. you cold brew those for a day. Just yeah. regular room temperature water. You you cover it up, you forget about it, and you let it drain. And then um, after you're done with the rest of your brew, you add those uh, right before you cool it down to, to get ready to pitch. Okay. Um, the advantage there is that you get all of the that 
those dark roasty flavors that you like without the bitterness that usually comes from boiling them. Okay. And so that helps make a nice smooth porter character. Um, at the same time, you know, there you do a a partial extract um, with some of the uh, some of the other grains. There's stout, stout grains and some uh, some Harrington malt uh, that went into that. And basically, it was not too much different than um, the 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 kind of a uh, 150 degree um, mash that we did with the the recipe I sent in for last week. Um, you just hold that for about 30 minutes to get all the, the complex sugars and stuff out of those grains. Um, then drain that with some, some hot water to, uh, to finish getting everything out. Um, and add a bunch of malt extract. In this case, I believe it used, uh, a liquid malt extract instead of a, a dry malt extract. Um, and, uh, there was already a, a, a hops schedule for this one. It had three different varieties of hops with it. And um, generally there are three different varieties of hops going into a beer. There's bittering hops, there's um, flavoring hops, there's aroma hops. And so in this case, the bittering hops were magnums, and uh, the, the weight amount was actually... Um, figured up to determine a specific amount of bitterness. Um, so there, the, the presence of alpha acids and the amount of time you boil those in the water uh, leads to a measure called IBUs, or uh, I believe it's international bitterness units, but I, I could be wrong here. Um, and that gives you a, a scalar amount of bitterness. So um, stuff like uh, a porter, for example, is lower on the bitterness scale, but something like this double IPA uh, that we were talking about with uh, Tim, about Tim's uh, brew at the top of the show, would be way up there. Um, and there are online calculators to figure all this out. I have no idea how you would figure it um, by hand. But Well, so... Uh, um... So Chris, help me out here. What 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 the hell does I mean IBU? That's something that I heard you mentioned before. What what the hell is that? What does that mean? And why why is why should that be important to me? So you're going to ask the guy who knows the least about beer. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, but you know so much about everything else. Can can I make up something? Yeah, hell, what the hell, you know. <laughs> It's international bittering units. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> all right, Jeff. What the hell is IBU? And what is that? Why should that be an important thing to uh, you know? I mean, this in beer making, braggot making. Well, the idea is that we want to know how bitter the the hops. Pay are attention, make. Chris. <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> get, get your paper and pencil out. Start taking notes. <laughs> Essentially, IBUs are a, a scale um, for determining how bitter something is going to be. And, okay. um, you know, if, if you've got something in the, um, the the high teens to the low 20s on this scale, it, you may have something like a, a kind of a light lager or a stout, uh, something that doesn't have as much bitterness. Um, on the other hand, if you have something in like the 60s to the 70s, that's generally where you find an IPA, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and I've seen some IPAs or the, the double IPAs or just the really aggressive IPAs that will go into the 90 to 120 range. Um, they wow. Just okay. Bitter as all get out. Yeah. Um, the the idea is this is a scale, and we want to use this to determine, you know, how bitter things are going to be. And it lets you predict based on, you know, the, the alpha acid content in your hops, which will be printed on the, the bag you get when you go buy your hops in the brew shop. Um, because these the, the alpha acid content also differs year to year. Um, so you, you need to use that to kind of dial in your bitterness. You don't want to overdo it just because, like, in the case of the... Um, the hopped mead that I made this year, the alpha acid crop in the saws hops that I was using, way more acid 
uh, this year than it was last year when I was making it before. And it just came out way too strong and way too bitter uh, because I didn't factor them in. Yeah. I know, uh, so, you know. Do you know, do you happen to know how to, to calculate IBUs? So uh, just to say, uh, if I wanted so, so many IBUs of this particular hop, uh, do you know how to calculate that and say uh, you need this many ounces of um, the way I've been doing it is going to brewersfriend.com and using their online calculator. <laughs> okay. Oh, that, 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 that works. I, had, I had one at, at one time. It was actually just a formula that I found and I wrote it down, and I can't find it. So I was just wondering if, if uh, there may be some other people out there who who need to convert. So we can go to brewersfriend.com. I believe it's brewersfriend.com. Yeah, it's, it, the website is brewersfriend. And they've got a whole host of different calculators, if I'm not mistaken, that give you all kinds of different things. Um, their their brewery, brewer, sorry, brewing uh, calculator, the, the recipe calculator, um, is what I've been using. You you can basically dial in an entire recipe for beer with you know all your different uh, grain varieties and your hop varieties, and it will do all the math for you. Oh, cool! That's right up my alley. Yeah, it's a good source to have. Um. All right. So okay. So I, I I know that as far as the IBUs go, then I'm I'm like somewhere right in the middle. I mean i I enjoy I enjoy a brewer's uh, work. You know, I want to be able to taste his work and his beer, and that's why I can't stand drinking. Uh, I I haven't. You know, as far as the Miller Coors, and, you know that whole thing out there. I just can't drink that beer anymore because I've drank craft beers for so long now, mm-hmm. and I enjoy the taste. I like I like tasting the different the grains, the hops. I, mean, I can taste it all, and that to me is what beer is supposed to taste like. So, uh, hey, yeah. Uh, you asked what I'd be use is. I made a guess and I was right. I just googled it. It's International Bitterness Unit. International Bitterness Unit. Okay. Learn something good. new. IBU. Okay. Um, yeah, now, you better be taking notes because you're going to have to send them to me later. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll send you the link to Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Google. If it wasn't for Google and YouTube, I wouldn't know nothing. I'm telling you. Um. <laughs> well, so anyway, we've got bittering hops, and that's one of the three items. And then we've also got some flavoring hops, and we've got some aroma hops. Um, the bittering hops go in at like 60 minutes, and they stay in for the entire boil. And then you add some flavor hops, generally like in the 20 to 10 minute mark, um, and that that gives it some of the the hop flavor. Um, you get different flavors from different types of hops, and you just kind of have to explore the different varieties. Um, American hops, especially like the West Coast, tend to be very piney and citrusy. They have a lot of bite. They have a lot going on. Um, English hops tend to be very floral or earthy. Um, German hops can be also be very floral, um, although there are some some stronger variations of those too. So when you talk when you're talking West Coast, you're talking about hops that are grown somewhere out here on the West Coast. Is that is that? Uh... Yeah, the the Cascade Mountains up in Oregon and Washington are okay. a uh, just a oh, huge. Okay. There are so many varieties of hops that have come out of that region in the last few decades. Um, I know it's, that. It's, yeah, yeah. There's uh, Citra Cascade, and um, th- there's actually a blend that I've been playing with a little bit. Um, called Falconer's Flight that uses what they call the, the seven seas, which is just seven different varieties of hops from that region that all happen to start with C, and they all make it into a, a, a like a multi um, multi hop blend for both bitterness and the the aroma and flavor. Now, is the IBU quotient? Is that how, how does that relate to a recipe in I mean, how much how much hops do you know how to, you know, like this braggot that uh, Aaron sent, uh, you know, if it had just a little bit. But I mean, knowing that hop 
editions come in ounces, not pounds like everything else does. Uh, you know, I mean, just I, I, I couldn't tell Aaron how many more ounces it would take. You know, maybe not even a half an ounce, just a little bit more uh, would have been perfect. Well, uh, that like so a how do you know? You use a calculator. The it okay. ultimately depends on the amount of acid in the hops and how how much you're going to use to dial it in. I mean, if uh, like the the case of the magnums that I use for the bittering quotient on this porter. They typically have a an alpha acid content of about fifteen percent. Um, okay. That's that's rather on the high side. That's actually really high. Um, that's more of a something you use for an IPA. So that would take maybe an eighth to a quarter of an ounce um, to just bump it up a little bit, and you still might be overdoing it. Um, on the other hand, if you look at something like um, Kent Goldings or Styrian Goldings, these are an English aroma hop. They have almost no bitterness whatsoever, but they pack a lot of that floral hoppy smell. Um, those top out around 2% alpha acid, okay. and you could probably throw in a half an ounce of that easily, and you might still not hit where you're going for it. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um. Well, I'm looking, uh, you know, when we started talking about these braggots uh, and everything, I, you know, I, I, I've been out there looking at different recipes. I'm going to use a ready-made kit. Um, I need more experience in, in doing this. So I think it was, you know, for me it was better that I just go that route. Uh, besides that, I'm not set up to do, you know, full mash type of stuff. Uh, which I would probably enjoy doing, but I uh, just can't do that uh, right now. So uh, the, the extract kits that I've been looking at, uh, and I pretty much settled on one only because I love my beer and I love my bourbon, and this happens to be a bourbon barrel porter. Uh, but I'm wondering now... Um, I'm wondering if that's even an appropriate beer recipe to put honey in uh, my only throwback to that is Jack Daniels puts out a Tennessee honey uh, that is a it's a sweet drink I mean, it's basically whiskey mixed with a little bit of honey uh, and it's a very nice smooth drinking uh, I guess you could call it whiskey um so I keep thinking about that, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking how, how well that tastes, how good that tastes. So I keep my eyeball on this bourbon barrel porter. Now, it's made with, I've got the rest of uh, the ingredients right here. It's made with English chocolate malt, uh, English dark crystal, uh, English black malt, the hops, uh well, it actually has uh, two pounds of wheat malt, dried uh, dried uh, extract, and six pounds of dark malt uh, extract syrup. The hops are Chinook. Now, you know, this will probably mean more to you and Aaron uh, and maybe Chris than, than it does to me, but uh, it uses Chinook hops, Golding, Goldlings, Goldings, I guess that is, mm-hmm. Uh for the hops. Yep. Uh, so Chinook is your bitter hop in this case, and the uh, the golden are your aroma and flavor. Yeah, because those two go in. One goes, the, the Chinook goes in right at the beginning of the boil. Uh, the other two, uh, the Goldings, uh, one goes in at 15 minutes, and then the other one at five minutes right there towards the end. So, And then... Uh, you know, the end result is you put three ounces of uh, uh, American uh, medium toast oak uh, that have been soaked in 16 ounces of bourbon, and you toss that entire, the entire stuff in. So you put 16 ounces of bourbon with your oak cubes. And so I'm going to dump, uh, you know, I'm going to dump, you know, a couple of pounds of honey in on top of that. 
So that's what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, as far as you guys, I mean, let's go to Chris. Uh, have you been looking at any recipes, anything out there that you want to try? Yeah, uh, I've, I've got it down to two. I'm almost certain I'm going to rehash the, the Irish red ale. Okay. Uh, the uh, the other one that I was looking at was your second choice, which was the, the chocolate milk uh, stout. Right. And, uh, you know, it's really a toss-up. Yeah. I like that chocolate... Uh... I mean, I could do either one of these. Uh, that chocolate milk stout looked uh, pretty interesting to me, but I, I'm so I'm so leaning more towards this bourbon barrel thing, uh, and that's probably the direction that I'm going to go. Aaron, have you have you looked at recipes or anything strike your fancy that uh, you want to try as far as to brag it or uh, something you've already done that you want to improve on? You know, I. <laughs> I think I, I like the base recipe that I used for this braggot that, that I sent to you. Um, I think if I am or if I do at some point in the future put together another braggot, I, I really want to go in the direction of like a black IPA or like a, a real hopped up porter type of a style. I, I haven't settled on, on a recipe and, and really – carved out exactly what, what I'll be doing, um, but maybe something with some specialty grains like some black malt or chocolate malt, um, some of the same types of, of specialty grains that, that you're looking at doing with the um, that porter, but then something with some some hops that, that would be on the higher alpha acid percentage side. Um, yeah. Some Chinook, you know, that might be a good way to go. The Citra or Centennial. Um, all, all hops that are kind of calling out to me for, for that type of a style. Yeah. Well, uh, this, uh, this Irish red ale that I'm looking at, it's the extract kit with specialty grain. And, uh, what I was planning on doing is actually, uh, changing up the hops because, uh, um, just take out the ones that are in the kit and I was going to replace them with the ones that I used before which was uh, Chinook, Arroyca, and uh, the, the East uh, Kent Goldings. Um, and that, that's sort of what I'm looking for because the last one, was, it was missing something. And I think probably it's going to be in the specialty grains that's going to really add the, the Irish flavor. You know, um, another difference is that the, uh, the one I made before had, uh, I used dark DME. And this one comes with golden DME, so it's going to be a, a different flavor profile there as well. Um, um, so I'm, I, you know, I really want to do that chocolate milk stout, but uh, I don't know. There's something I, I, I really think this this red ale needs to it needs to be done a little bit better than I did before. Time to bring it back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't like to leave something alone until it's until it's good, you know, until it's as good as it can be. Yeah. Well, and that's you know, I mean, this is the one thing that I enjoy about this. I mean, you know, as soon as I get, man, I think I have found my my little niche here. You know, um, Jeff and I were having a discussion, you know, before we launched the show tonight, uh, you know, about doing braggers, and I told him that. You know, I, out of all the meads that I've had, I'm, I'm, I'm finding that I just might not be that mead guy. Uh, it may be that, you know, this braggot thing is where I want to spend my time in, in mead making. Uh, forget the style. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, I, 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 as much as it is a style of mead, I, I, that really doesn't concern me. What does concern me is putting out a good product, and if it's called a braggot and if it's the mead catalog, then that, that then that's fine. But uh, you know, I have to go back to that. I mean, the only other braggot that I ever had was the one that Aaron sent me, and that just put that that just put it uh, that just put it all to bed for me. Uh, that's absolutely three beer guys, and and 
Now there, then there was one. I'll have to carry the mood show. <laughs> Chris, Chris trying to bring me along is you know in, in the melomel world, but uh, well, I do have a peach. I mean, I got that peach thing going too. Um, yeah, but one doesn't count. One doesn't count. You yeah. gotta have a room full. That's true. Uh, that's well, okay. Hey, I'll, I'll carry the show, and uh, yeah, so, so, so you guys come back around. I'll yeah. I'll be persevering. I'll, I'll be here, yeah. Yeah. I just uh, for the world, and and I'll be waiting when you get back. <laughs> God, somebody send him a box of Kleenex, please. Uh, let me get, let me get my fist. Yeah, Scott, you live in Corinth. Why don't you just run over a box of Kleenex over to Chris's house, would you please? Uh, Beer. Oh my God. So, but anyway, so, so yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking this, right. You know, this is like, this is like unexplored territory. It's like Star Trek, you know, uh, man, I can see so much. And really part of the reason it is so unexplored is because commercial mead makers have an awful time trying to, to do anything with it. Um, in this varies of course, state by state, but in Kansas, if you want to do, um, mead, and uh, and so you, if you want to do a braggot, you basically have to have a winery license and a brewery license, and then you have to have a tape line on the floor, and all the wine stuff has to happen in one area, and all the beer stuff has to happen in another area, and God forbid you try to ferment the two together. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've heard. I hope you make a, a good. I mean, an absolutely fabulous braggot and entered in a contest and win. This would this would just top it all off. If you got a blue ribbon on it, I want a picture of it. Yeah. And I hope it says I hope it says pass on it. <laughs> if it doesn't, if it doesn't, I'm going to Photoshop it on there and post it somewhere. <laughs> Oh my God! I'm never gonna, li- you know. Chris has got my damn phone number too. Isn't that a, isn't that some? Anyway, so yeah, so uh, well, you know, it, it is a mead, Chris. I mean, for crying out loud, you know, uh, it does. It is a category of mead, so I'm just just doesn't have any fruit in it. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get over it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll Hey, I'm making one with you, so I'm 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 not there you go. Well, I mean, uh, you know, and I know you're you're not much of a beer drinker, right? I, mean, I think I think we've had that discussion before, but I mean, it's still me. Uh-huh. Yeah. You well, know? I, I don't drink much alcohol. Period. Uh, yeah. I, I make mead because I enjoy it and, and end up giving it away, but sure. Uh, uh, no, I'm not a beer drinker at all, really, and and that's why I just don't have any knowledge whatsoever. Of, uh, I mean, when I when I finalize this decision on what I'm going to do, uh, there's going to be an email going out to all of you guys to get your opinion before I do it because sure. I, I literally have no knowledge of it at all. So. Well, I, you know, I mean, I'm I'm right I'm right there in the same uh, in the same boat with you. I mean, uh, all I know is what we've learned on this show and 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 things that I read. So I mean, that's this is the challenge of it. Uh, this is why we do this show. Uh, yeah, I'm you just, know, I'm just messing with you. I, I'm I'm all for learning new things. Uh, I'm, I'm just messing with you about the. Sure, about I know. You are. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's it's totally out of my league, and and so you know it's good sometimes to step out of your comfort zone and do something that that you've yeah. never done. But, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, you know I mean uh, my bucket list. I mean I'm I'm doing I'm doing beer, I'm mead, uh, wine, uh, trying to do it all. So uh, uh, this braggot thing. You know, the thing about it is, too, I mean, uh, 
first and foremost, I'm a beer drinker before I'm a drinker of anything else. Then I'm a bourbon drinker, and then I'm a wine drinker. So in that order. Uh, it's good to be a well-rounded alcoholic. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, my wife and I, since we since we started drinking craft beer, it's been a lot of fun. You know, going to places like Bevmo or Total Wine, where they just literally have thousands of bottles of beer on the shelf and just picking out one that you know i mean whether the label looks unique or whether the name of the beer is unique or or whatever uh and just grabbing a couple off the shelf and taking them home and and drinking them that's just that's just so much fun for us you know uh, and then we get to sit around and talk about it, what we liked about it, what we didn't like. If we liked it, it goes on a list, and we go back and get it again. And this braggart thing uh, is right up that alley, you know. So if you are a beer drinker, uh, Aaron, I, you know, I mean, come on, you make braggarts. Uh Are you a beer drinker too? You got to be. Oh, one hundred percent. You know, I, I enjoy mead and very commonly will drink it, but usually, you know, if it's a night where I'm I'm enjoying a few drinks, you know, maybe it's one glass of mead and then I switch over to beer, and, and that's what I have a couple glasses of. So definitely more of a, a beer guy. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, so one thing that I didn't mention at the top of the show, this is our last show, uh before we go on break and uh we've definitely got our our work cut out for us over the next couple of weeks before we come back so uh we really need to hustle out there and let's finalize uh, because the next show that we do i want to be talking about the specific recipes that each of us are going to do with this brag it uh, how we're going to put it together, how much honey, what kind of honey that we're going to use. I want to get more into that uh, when we come back from our break. So, uh, I, you know, uh, if you're not taking notes, take notes. Uh, you know, I, I think this is going to be a good thing. I mean, we've explored Melomel's uh, a little bit on the show. We did the uh, traditional thing uh, to start with, uh, you know, branching off into this braggart thing, uh, I think is a cool thing. Um, you know, and I don't know where to go from here. So, Jeff, I mean, you know, you're kind of you're kind of the braggart king around here too. So, uh, you know, what, well, tell tell me what's on your mind as far as braggarts go. You know, um, this. The saison that I put together is the first time that I've done a braggart that is not uh, based on a beer kit, um, and it's it's still very simple. It is still very kit like in that it it's mostly extract with a little bit of specialty grains for some head retention and some like mouthfeel body uh, additions. So um, I, I I have a lot to learn about beer myself. Um, I I definitely enjoy drinking it, but I would be lost uh, trying to put one together. On my own, um, I figured out a lot more about hops than I have beer itself. Um, mainly because I like what hops does to meat as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's something that I need to learn too. Because uh, I, I, I mean, I like what hops do to beer. Uh, I like what it did to Aaron's braggart. And so, yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, I yeah. need to know more about hops and what they contribute, uh, you know, as far as flavors, aromas, that kind of thing. So, and I, I mean, and where do you go to get that? I mean, the only source, uh, you know, and like in mead, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, if you're into mead making, there's really only one source out there, and that's gotmead.com. Uh, as Chris well knows, I, I have spent literally days sitting here at my computer. I've gone to every mead resource out there, and there's really nothing better than the Got Mead because it's so full of people who have been doing it for many, many years uh, and are, are, are excellent resources. Beer, on the other hand, the only place 
that I know of to really get good information is out at homebrewtalk.com. Uh, that seems to be the the premier uh, forum uh, as far as your beer making. And they cover the full gamut, whether you're doing partial mash or full mash or extract or, or whatever it is. So, mm-hmm. and, I, and I haven't found anywhere else, really. Uh, there just isn't any place else. Well, if you're looking you on know, the go ahead, Eric. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think um, one thing I, I might bring up here, if you're looking for a good book to read on beer, kind of the equivalent of Ken Tram's The Complete Mead Maker that I would definitely recommend on the beer side is Charlie Papazian's The Complete Joy of Home Brewing. Um, this was the, the first book I really got into on, on home brewing. There's, there's a little bit of the book, a portion on mead as well, um, but just a, a really well put together book. It, it's a fun read. His, his style is, you know, he's, he's um, kind of lighthearted, and, but at the same time, you, you learn a lot with the, the book, so definitely worthwhile. Got it. Yep. Uh, and I just, I just haven't cracked the, uh, the cover on it yet, but uh, absolutely. So awesome. It is. You're, it you're is in for a treat. A um, I, I like that he goes through a lot of different techniques with it and he generally has a recipe for every technique that he's, he's talking about too. So that if you follow along and you really want to get into brewing beer and just brew a lot of beer, um, you can try all these different recipes yourself and kind of pick and choose what techniques you like. Um, you're going to be making a lot of beer in the process, but you know you've got that option available to you if you're interested. Have um, you got uh, Have you got that one, Chris? Uh, yeah, somewhere I, I can't <laughs> find my complete meat maker. Uh, I, I've got to find it because I'm starting to panic without it. Yeah, I was gonna say that's like that's like losing your Bible, isn't it? I mean, if you're a Baptist and lose your Bible, man, you're up you're up a creek, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I guess. I'm not a Baptist. But. <laughs> uh, All right. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I got to find it. I've, I've turned everything upside down, and I don't know what I did with it, but uh, uh, somebody needs to start some kind of a fundraiser or something for me to get another one. <laughs> go fund me. Let's get a go fund me going for Chris and replace it. Yeah, send me some Paxil or something too in yeah. the meantime. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, enough about the uh, Braggit talk. Uh, like I said, uh, this is our last show before we go on hiatus. We take a two-week break. Uh, for those of you who are uh, just listening for the first time uh, and will listen to the replay, we're going to take a two-week break. We do six shows, and then we're off a couple of weeks, uh, kind of rethink, do you know, take a breather, catch up, and then uh, we come back and do six more. So in our break time, uh, we're going to explore a little more deeply this whole bragging thing and... I, for one, need to know more about hops and, and what they contribute. So that's going to be my uh, my little homework assignment. So when we do come back, let's try to have our individual recipes down pat. We know exactly what we're going to do, how we're going to approach it, and uh, we'll talk about it uh, on the air. If anybody else uh, uh, wants to do it along with us, if I can get – if I can get the three of these guys, the two of these guys, the uh, three of these guys to send me their recipes before we come back, we'll put them up on the website so that you can actually see what each of us are doing, what we're talking about, what ingredients we're going to be using. And, uh, you know, we'll just call it Just Brag It, Aaron Brag It, uh, so on and so forth. So, um, Speaking of the website, uh, when we come back from break, uh, we probably need to touch quickly on uh, the the cherry project we've got going. Also, yeah, uh, that should be clearing now pretty well, and uh, it's going to be getting close to time to start tasting it and considering any adjustments we need to make. So, yeah. we'll we'll touch on that too. Absolutely, um, and that's a couple of projects that we've got uh, under our belt so far. We did the traditional, the orange blossom uh, special, and now the cherry mead. So, uh, um, 
And both of those recipes are up on the website, themeathouse.com. Uh, guys, I'm about ready to start another big DIY project. Uh, and that's something that I love doing, and, and I like sharing on the show. We've got, uh, I know that there's at least two people out there already. Actually, if you include Chris, uh, there's actually, I know of uh, three people out there who have uh, begun to explore their own uh, temperature control uh, environment based off of the uh, system that I put together. I think that's a cool thing, and, you know, feel free to modify it however it suits you. Uh, this project is one that's going to take some time, though. Uh, Chris is already pretty much in tune about it. Uh, he knows what it is because uh, I called him the other day. But what I'm doing is putting together a kegerator. So uh, you got Chris and Jeff, or I mean uh, Aaron and Jeff, know what what those are, right? Not sure. <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, that'll be a good uh, good addition to your brew shop there too. Yep. Can I give Can I give one interesting detail, and we'll just leave it a mystery. Uh, yeah. It involves a ceiling tile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if, if that doesn't confuse you, I don't know what would. Yeah. Actually, at this point, Chris, it may involve a couple of ceiling tiles. Uh, since we last spoke, uh, I have made countless trips to both Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, today I came home with the lumber, and I've, I've got my design all drawn out, uh, and uh, we're going to build this thing. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to take me a little while to uh, to get it all together. I've got my equipment ordered. It will be here on Thursday. The two kegs, the uh, CO2 canister, all the beer lines, the the pressure lines, the whole nine yards. So the valves, spigots, everything. So um, I want to try to take that, pick- that setup that we discussed with the with the tile and the leather and everything. You still going to do that, right? Oh yeah, oh, the le- leather is going to be involved. Uh, but it may be just a little bit different. So, um, I, st- I'm still kind of, uh, I'm still kind of, uh, developing plans as I go, but absolutely leather. If, if, if not the ceiling tile, the leather will absolutely be involved. So, um, but this DIY project, uh, <laughs> it kind of started out because I've heard, I've heard and I watched these YouTube videos about guys making beer. A very educational process. And the one thing they all have in common is they hate bottling beer. Uh, and so I explored the idea of, of, you know, buying this kegging system. And then I thought, well, okay, so you wind up with a, a, a keg, a bottle of CO2, and this little I think Chris called it a picnic tap or whatever. I thought, nah, you know, I, I got to do something better than that. So then I started, you know, exploring these kegerator things online. And, you know, guys are taking refrigerators and turning them into these kegerators. So I went out and I bought one of the most common refrigerators uh, used to build these kegerators, small one, is a Danby 4.4 cubic foot refrigerator. Uh, There's no freezer unit in it, so you don't have to worry about that. Easily modified to accept two uh, five-gallon kegs uh, with a little modification to the door. I mean, there's some plastic that has to be cut out and and whatnot. Uh, And uh, the, uh, the equipment that I chose Tip, you know, typically a lot of these uh, conversion kits you see, they're, they're these tower things. They come with these chrome or stainless steel tower with a couple of spigots on it or even a single. Uh, I decided to go full custom and went to a uh, a regular, what they call a door mount. And 
uh, the design is going to be kind of a Western uh, motif uh, with some of uh, Chris's leather work uh, and uh, most likely a, bra a, a copper ceiling tile uh, as uh, part of the decking for the uh, for the counter. So, uh, but anyway, so I'm going to try to take pictures along the way uh, when we start working on this thing. So. You know, we can create some kind of a journal. I'll have updates uh, on the, you know, on the shows that we do. Uh, but so that that's my next big uh, DIY project. So what do you think? I like the sounds of it. It's, yeah, it's, I, I like that you're putting a lot of thought into a lot of personalization into it, too. Yeah, the, the thought when I started hearing about the ceiling tiles, I was thinking when JD does it, he does it big. <laughs> yeah, if you can imagine a kegerator that involves a ceiling tile, and actually this ceiling tile is a very important part of this whole setup. So, yeah. uh, you know that's that's going to be very unique. Yeah, and I, you know, I had the, between Lowe's and Home Depot, I had the opportunity to actually see these ceiling tiles. Uh, you know, they're they're big; they're twenty four by twenty four, but there are they're three they're three dimensional. In other words, there's a raised portion. So, I've got to be pretty careful about the kind of ceiling tile that I pick. Uh, because if that gets used as the surface for the countertop, you know, I got to remember that, you know, we're going to be putting glasses of beer down and, uh, they need to sit on something solid and not, uh, you know, on something that might tip over. So something that I've got to consider. You might be able to find something like a hammered copper that's just got a little texture to it or something. That's yeah, that's... Flat. That's what I'm looking for. Um, these ceiling tiles come in in different material, and I've looked at the tin and the copper. The problem that I may have with copper, uh, and I need to explore this a little bit more. I don't know if it's treated or not, or you know has some kind of a coating on it. But the problem that you know always happens with copper when it gets wet, it corrodes, and you get this ugly green. Uh, uh, you know, stuff all over it. So well, that's for, uh, that's part of the patina. But if you don't want that, you can always get some a can of uh, you know, like some clear acrylic or something to yeah. to spray it with. Well, uh, I, I I've considered that, and then also uh, I think it was now now. I'm, Boy, this is the part where you really don't want to get old. Uh, I've been to Home Depot and Lowe's so many times. I can't even remember what I saw at each place. But one of them uh, has these ceiling tiles that are actually made of a PVC plastic. And you you put a metal one, to, you know, side by side with one of these plastic ones, and you can't tell the difference. Uh, so I may even go that route. Easy cleanup if something gets wet on it. I don't have to spray anything on it to protect it. Uh, you know, uh, so that may be the route I go. Uh, the only problem that I would have with it, if it cracks, or if I break it or, or something, it's going to be really hard to replace because they're going to be glued in place uh, on the uh, on the uh, plywood uh, surface. So I've just got to be careful with that. So, but that's even if I use the ceiling tiles on the surface, I may put them as on the side of the uh, box because I'm building a I'm building a box basically that's going to hold the refrigerator and then you drill a two inch hole actually to, uh, yeah two and a half inch hole on top of the refrigerator you use a piece of two inch pipe PVC pipe uh, to come up through that up through the countertop that's where your beer lines come up into uh, and then uh, into your uh, into the uh, actually it's going to be a, a wooden box that sits on top of the counter that these spigots are attached to. So uh, you, you know if you want to go the redneck route and put linoleum on it too. <laughs> yeah, 
nineteen fifties. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, linoleum, lots of chrome. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the new project at the uh, at the Web House at the at the Mead House uh, Brewery here. So uh, you know, and these refrigerators, I mean, they're cheap. I mean, it was like a hundred and twenty five bucks at Costco, and uh, I don't feel bad taking my Dremel to it and carving the plastic out of it, <laughs> boring holes in the top, you know. So. But that's uh, that's the project. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to the whole kegging thing. Um, uh, you know, being able to keg these braggots, uh and my beer projects. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So, sounds like it. I, I like the direction you're going with that, JD. <laughs> so, but uh, at any rate. Is anybody else got uh, projects working? Well, let's just go through the hopper list and whatever you're working on. Let's start with Chris. Uh, I know Chris has been busy, uh, uh, you know, here lately, but uh, anything uh, in the works, Chris? Well, I did get that sourwood traditional started because I had to try out that Yeti. Uh, good yeah. God, I can't believe I spent that much. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah. you might be interested to know, uh, and I hope this doesn't make you jealous, uh, I'm approaching day six, and I haven't put any more ice in it yet. boy, There you go, baby. You, hey, you know what? <laughs> uh, I don't know what your, what, what your ambient temperature is like there where you've got the Yeti. Oh, around 68. Oh, dude, uh, you should be you should be eight. Eight or nine days into it, uh, how many pumps are you running at one time? I, I've just got the one going right now, but uh, what I did, I took uh, three containers. Uh, each one held two quarts of water, and I froze those three containers. And I've still got, well, I mean, there's, they're hardly any smaller than they were six days later. So, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, just, there's. Uh, just enough water to cover the pumps, right? Yep, just enough. Yep. And yep. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I have I've lost maybe twenty percent of the of the ice in six right. days. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's good to go. There's this this batch is going to finish out completely, and I doubt I have to put any more in. Yeah, you're not you're not going to be changing ice until like November. <laughs> Yeah, it may be good for two batches. <laughs> but I'm, I'm running awesome. the I'm running the thermostat at, at 62 degrees, so uh, yeah. So I'm keeping it down, and uh, you know, ambient temperature around 68. So it's not having to come on that often because everything is insulated so well. Um, well, uh, you, you know. know we, we 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 talk about these coolers. I mean, I spent uh, you know, close to three hundred dollars for the cooler that I have, uh, the Pelican, and uh, I know what a Yeti costs. It's damn close to that, if not more, especially the size that you got. Uh, and that's a huge investment for a do-it-yourself project. But the alternative is, is spending literally thousands of dollars on glycol units. Uh, and that, I, I just, I mean, as, as much as I could probably go out and buy one, I just, I had a hard time reckoning with myself that, you know, I'm going to go out and spend eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 on a glycol unit just to cool, you know, uh, my carboys and my, my fermenters. I just, just, I, I just could not get past that. Yeah. And so, I just don't need, I mean, even uh, for, forget the Yeti and all that. I mean, you could get a Coleman cooler and put this thing together, sure. and I mean, it's going to work fine. Uh, and you put around it uh, a Coleman cooler, and uh, you know, it's just too easy. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. So, uh, all right. 
So uh, the sour wood, you got the sour wood going. Uh, uh, anything else you got in the hopper? Not at the moment, but I'll be getting that okay. beer kit in pretty soon. So cool. that'll be the next thing. Jeff, uh, you got anything going on there? Well, you, we've talked about the uh, the saison that I'm working on, and so by the time we come back in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll be into secondary with that, and I'll probably have a little bit better idea of what it's tasting like and what I want to do as far as you know spices or dry hopping or you know, extra stuff to uh, to help bring some of those flavors out. Yeah. Um, you know, beyond that, I'm still working on my refrigerator uh, chiller system. I've uh, I've cut into the the wall between the two. Uh, units because it's got a freezer and a, a refrigerator side by side, and for the most part, it's just foam. Um, I have discovered that there's not a lot of structure of stability um, on the, the the door side once I get the foam out of the way there. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of carefully cutting that out and replacing it with a nice thick uh, piece of wood um, to, to kind of buttress that uh, the, the piece of metal that the doors close to um, and keep everything in square there. Um, okay. but, uh, there's a little bit of mechanical stuff in the, the far back, um, part of that wall that I'm kind of carefully kind of chiseling out, if you will, yeah. to make sure that it's nothing I'm, I'm going to miss. Uh, but it looks like I should be able to make one large fermentation chamber and maybe get, you know, 20 to 25, uh, gallons, uh, worth of fermenters going at once. <laughs> plus a, a big shelf up top for my one gallon yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, the um, this refrigerator you're working on, it's got a freezer unit and a uh, and a refrigeration unit. Or are they work you know w- working off the same compressor? They are working off the same compressor. I determined that the, uh, the essentially it's just taking a, a fan unit to blow cold air from the freezer into the refrigerator. Um, so I, I've got. Basically, now that there's a giant hole between the two, I've got one giant freezer, um, and I've just okay. got my uh, my temperature controller is going to work to that, um, and I've got a little ceramic heating unit that I'm going to put on the bottom to to give me a heat controller as well. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, you know, you've got that. Uh, you've got the same uh, stainless steel fermenter that I've got. If you uh, I'd have to check on their website, but if you get the neoprene jacket that goes around the fermenter, it's an insulation jacket, mm-hmm. and you can order these. Uh, they're they're made for brewing. They're they're heaters that come on a mylar surface, and they're very thin. Uh, and I just simply taped uh, two of them up to my my twins here. Uh, between the uh, the stainless steel, the outside of the stainless steel, and then of course the inside of the neoprene insulator, uh, and that serves as my heating unit. And I've come within a degree, one way or the other, uh, hot or cold. Uh, something you might want to consider. What's that, Chris? Uh, that's something I haven't done yet with mine. I haven't put the the heating element in, so I'm I'm running strictly on cooling right now. Yeah. Um, which is not an issue in the summertime, but this winter it's probably going to become an issue. So I'm going to have to get that hooked up. Yeah, and you know, uh, you know, for the folks out there listening to the show talking about this DIY stuff, uh, a simple heat pad, heating pad uh, that you find at uh, uh, what uh, you know Walgreens or or you know you know like. I don't know, we used to call it thrifties, but, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. A regular heating pad you plug in, it's got a little little switch on it. Those work, too. So uh, you got to be careful with them, though, because a lot of them have a timer on them that automatically shut off. Don't recommend that you try to rewire it unless you're an electrician and bypass the timer. But uh, those do work as far as a heat source. You know, if you need to heat up a uh, a fermenter that uh, you know has got, you know, most of the part that's it's a stuck fermentation that you're dealing with. You need to apply some heat. A heating pad is a good way to go. So uh, well, I've discovered 
there's an advantage to the uh, using a refrigerator because it also holds in heat pretty well. Yeah. Um, I was fiddling with all the controls and stuff, and I took that offline. What I didn't realize is that I also disengaged the little uh, the closure tab that tells the the refrigerator whether or not it's open. Um, so that left the light bulb going for about a day and a half before I came back to look at it again, and it was boiling in there. Um, after <laughs> only just having this one little, it must have been like a ten or fifteen watt little incandescent light bulb, just the the light in the fridge. Um, but that heat just built and built and built. So, you know, I'm calling that proof of concept right there. Yeah. Yeah, you're on your way to a uh, to a nice little fermentation chamber there, I think, and. Uh... Uh, we'll, uh, you know, keep track of what you're doing and, uh, you know, other people, if you're, if you're, you know, creating some kind of a journal with your plans, what you're doing or everything, or, you know, uh, write it all down so we can keep, uh, you know, maybe even put it up on the website and let people know that, Hey, you know what, if you've got an old refrigerator, uh, make a fermentation chamber out of it. So, yeah. um, Aaron, uh, what you got in the hopper, dude? Uh, I know, I, I, I know there's some some things going on. We haven't. Uh, you're 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 kind of leaning towards maybe or maybe not. But uh, come on, what you yeah. got in the hopper? What, what, what's yeah. on the list? <laughs> so you know, I um, I think this uh, the beer kit definitely something I, I'm interested in getting underway here, hopefully in the near future. Like, like you're saying, I've, I've got some stuff going on. I, I may be taking just a temporary, hopefully not too, too long brewing hiatus. Um, also kind of clearing out some of the carboys. I, I'm just stopping over in that side of the basement now. And i um, still got some full carboys with the hopped meads and, and the coffee boche, the, uh, this sweet wildflower traditional as well. Um, so definitely looking forward to getting those in the bottles. Um, but one way or the other, definitely going to research this this black IPA style braggot and uh, at least get the plans down on paper for what that would look like. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I think uh, where you can actually do the brew with us, you can at least uh, go ahead and formulate your recipe and sure. we'll compare notes. Absolutely. I, um, God, I've got so much going on. Uh, I've got, the only thing I've got uh, cooking right now is a five gallon Cabernet that, uh, I put black currants in, uh, it's fermenting right now. So, uh, I'm not going to do anything until, uh, I get this other project, uh, completed. I got enough stuff sitting back in corners of the room that are, uh, under oak and, and aging, um, a couple of projects that I'm, I'm really anxious about. Uh, one is that sourwood. My God, if you haven't done a sourwood traditional yet, dude, you got to do that. If you can get your hands on some sourwood honey out of Tennessee, the stuff is amazing. Uh, I was lucky enough to get some from Chris and uh, put it together in a traditional. Uh, we had some issues with stuck fermentations. It managed to get down to a level uh, that I'm happy with. I think we're going to wind up with about, what do we say, Chris, about 125 percent 13% somewhere in there, uh, alcohol. Yeah, about there. Yeah, it's sitting on some Hungarian oak right now, and I've, I've been tasting it uh, about once a week, uh, and it's coming along nicely. I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really thinking this one's going to, going to turn out nice. So, uh, but I've got various projects uh, sitting in a car, boys. I've got a uh, traditional that's almost two years, actually it'll be two years old in January. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it sit uh, and uh, uh, see what happens to it. Uh, I take a taste of it every now and again. It's coming along uh, very nicely. Um the peach uh, melomel mel that uh, we racked into a three-gallon carboy the other day, pulled the uh, fruit bag out of it, and I got to tell you that that lalamand or what's it called, Chris? Lalazine. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, Lalazine EX and and Lalazine uh, uh, C Max. That works. That'll work peach peach uh, pulp into 
nothing. I mean, it'll turn it to liquid like you wouldn't believe. It's better. It's better than a food processor. Um, so the fruit came out of it. Uh, it's just sitting in a corner where it was under airlock and uh, finishing out in secondary, and we're just gonna let it ride. So uh, it's down to about uh, zero three zero now. Uh, hoping it gets down to around twenty zero zero two. We started out at one twenty. Um, you know, and if it stops now, I'm happy with it. It tastes good. It's not sweet. Got definitely has a peach flavor to it. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, it, it's coming to a point where I really like it. So, but that's pretty much what uh, JD's got going on. Uh, other than this big project I'll, I'm going to be working on over the next few weeks uh, or longer. <laughs> um and I'll I'll see if I can take pictures. Uh, try, I'm going to try to document my process with this thing. You know, again, I mean, it, this is, um, you know, use your imagination. I mean, just go out there, Google, uh, you know, kegerator ideas. Just put that in your Google search, and you'd be surprised what you come up with. I looked at a lot. I mean, I spent a couple of days looking at tons and tons and tons of them. And you'd be amazed what guys are doing with refrigerators, with uh, freezers, uh, with these little uh, mini fridges, uh, like I've got this little Danby. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, if you want to put yourself a kegerator together, uh, you know, uh, look into it. Um, but uh, that's what I'm doing. So, other than that. Uh, gosh, guys, we kind of run out of time, and I'm kind of getting hungry. <laughs> oh, yeah. About dinner time in your neck of the woods. <laughs> About dinner time in my neck of the woods. So, uh, tell you what, we're going to take a couple of weeks off. Uh, apologize for the beginning of the show. We started out kind of raw. Uh, but once in a while, hey, you know what? We're on. A, we don't have a budget, uh, and uh, you know we do what we can do here. So, uh, but uh, thanks for uh, Jeff, Chris, and Aaron uh, being here tonight, uh, and uh, Scott uh, certainly appreciate. It. I need to hire Scott as the engineer, and uh, he's helped me out with the show here. He kept posting uh, stuff to my uh, my uh, message on my phone thing about can't hear the show so uh appreciate you uh keeping me informed there scott but until uh, next time a couple of weeks uh back here on our tuesday night check the website themeathouse.com facebook is simply the mead house uh for all the information about the show we'll see you then